Well, Christ has risen. The most important question you will ever ask in your life is who is Jesus? It's more important than questions about our world, like the economy or politics. It's more important than questions of identity, like your purpose or your significance in this world. It's even more important than questions about your destiny, what happens to you when you die. Jesus Christ is the answer behind every meaningful question you will ever ask. We've been in a series of messages these last couple weeks called Mere Jesus, where we're looking at essentially who Jesus Christ is. And we've been answering that question through the threefold formula of prophet, priest, and king. We've seen in this series that Jesus indeed is the prophet who reveals the truth of God, humanity, and the world. We saw last week that Jesus is our high priest who comforts and restores us. You know, as I was praying for you, church, about that message last week, one of the things I just continued to pray over and over again for you is that you indeed would experience the comfort and closeness, the very presence of God in your life. That's what your high priest means to you. But today and next week, we're going to be talking about Jesus as our king. In fact, John 20, just in a statement, sums up what he's saying in John 21 through 10 with this idea. The resurrected Jesus is the victorious king. What John 20 tells us is that the resurrected Jesus, the Jesus who is alive and ruling and reigning today, he is your victorious king. John 20 invites you and I to live differently in light of that victory because of what Christ has accomplished for us. You know, when you're in the presence of victory, you live differently. This past year, we saw our Texas Rangers win the World Series. Yes, I still can't believe it. So many years of disappointment, I still think I'm dreaming, right? Somebody needs to pinch me. But we had this big victory celebration, right? This parade, how many of you saw footage or coverage of the victory parade that went through our towns? It was pretty powerful. Thousands of people lined the street cheering and shouting. And the question is, what prompted such incredible praise and excitement and exuberance amongst those people? And it was the presence of victory. You see, when you're in the presence of victory, you live differently. John 20 is an invitation to see the different dimensions of Christ's victory on our behalf and how we're to live differently in light of the presence of that victory. I want to show you three of those today. The first of which I want you to write down if you're taking notes is a victorious era. The first thing John 20 shows us is that Jesus, through his resurrection, inaugurates a victorious era. Look at the first verse there in John chapter 20 to see how John shows us this. It says, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark. That phrase, first day of the week, is easy to just read over and skip ahead, but it's an important timestamp because it's doing more than just identifying when this happened. I believe John is wanting to frame how we're to think about time moving forward. John is saying, mark your time by the resurrection. Mark your life, not just by birthdays or holidays on the school calendar. Mark your life instead, week by week, by the resurrection of Jesus. Part of the reason, church, we gather together on Sunday and worship on Sunday is because we're saying as a church, we want to mark our time by the resurrected King Jesus. In the Old Testament, God told the children of Israel to mark their time by the Passover. He actually tells them in Exodus 12 when he's giving them instructions, look, this month is to be the first month in your year. In other words, mark your time by my deliverance in your life. Jesus Christ calls us to mark our time, to spend our lives week after week, remembering that the most significant event in the history of the world is the cross and the resurrection. The substance of this era is significant 
The reason we mark our time is because this new era, this resurrection moment, kicks off a new era of time in which we experience the presence and peace of God. Look at what the rest of the text says in verse 1. What did Mary see when she came? She saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. She saw that Jesus was alive. Now, verse 2 makes it clear that she doesn't fully understand that yet. She's going to later come to a fuller understanding of that. But we know reading this passage that what she's beholding is an empty tomb and a resurrected Jesus. It's important to remember that when Jesus rose from the dead, he rose not just as God, but as the God-man. Jesus Christ took on your humanity and mine, not just to die in our place, but to rise on our behalf. When Jesus Christ rose from the dead, ascended to the Father, and began to, as our high priest, intercede for us, he heals and restores us so we can experience God's presence. In the same way that an outlet plug has an input that that cord plugs into, you were created by God to know and experience God. You have an input, as it were, in your soul through which you experience the presence of God. The problem is sin distorts, mars, and bro- has, leaves that broken. What Jesus Christ does in the resurrection is he rises from the dead to heal, to restore humanity so that we can enjoy the loving, gracious, comforting presence of God. What you have in Jesus is not just a king, but a king who is priest, risen and victorious, healing you from the inside out. What this means then, church, is if we're going to live in light of the victory, if we're going to live differently in light of Christ's victory, we've got to live with joy in the victory of Jesus. If you're taking notes, you can write that down. Live with joy in the victory of Jesus. This new era marked by our enjoyment of God's presence is to be marked by joy. Now, joy is more than just an emotion. Joy is a state of mind. I would define joy, especially in light of this passage, as joy is gratitude for Christ's victory. Remember, the fuel for joy is gratitude. Gratitude is what fuels joy. Joy, this exuberance, this kind of vision of life that sees it through the lens of Christ, it's fueled in our lives through gratitude. Well, what is gratitude? Gratitude is a focus in your life on what's been done for you instead of what's been done to you. Gratitude is a heart posture that focuses on what's been done for you, not on what's been done to you. Our country tries to encourage this kind of mindset on days like Memorial Day or Veterans Day or July 4th, where we think about what's been done for us by people who've gone before us, people who've died, people who are still living, serving our country. We give thanks because we see what's been done for us. But oh, how easy it is, church, to be more focused on what's been done to us. I don't know about you. There are times in my life I feel like my talent is for seeing what's wrong with the world. Just kind of picking things apart, you know what I'm saying? It's easy to turn on the news, to watch social media, and not have any shortage of ammunition for what's wrong with the world, right? It's so easy if you're a leader of an organization to spend a lot of your time as a teacher in the classroom or as a business owner just to focus on what's wrong, what needs to get fixed, what's broken. But Christ's victory means what's been done for us is greater than anything that can be done to us. That does not mean that some of the things that some of you have gone through are not significant. I'm aware that there may be some of you that are coming to church for the first time in a long time, and maybe you're here today because of some hurt, even in church. Some things that have happened to you that were wrong, that were sin, that were sin that was committed against you. I want you to hear me. I am in no way wanting to minimize some of the wrongful, sinful things that have been done to you. But I can say with full assurance, based on the authority of God's word, if you're a Christian, what's been done for you is greater than anything that's been done to you. Christ, risen from the dead, 
inaugurating this new era by which we experience his presence means that we can focus on what's been done for us. Fight for joy, parents, at the part level of your gratitude, what's been done for you. Fight for joy, teachers, this time of year. I was talking to a teacher before the service. Teachers, fight for joy because of what's been done for you. Senior adults, as you look at the world and you see what's wrong and you think back to when things were better, fight for joy because of what's been done for you in Christ Jesus. Fight for joy at the level of your gratitude. Second thing this passage teaches us, though, is not just a victorious era. It also teaches us of a victorious power. Power is a theme that runs throughout this passage. Mary runs back from the tomb. She finds Peter and John. She misunderstands what's happened. She's still in the darkness. That theme is kind of more than just a timestamp. It's also kind of an allegory of what's going on here. And what we know from these verses is first that Christ's power is a definitive historical reality. It's important that we just take a moment this morning and say the resurrection is not a fable. It's not a story. It's not merely the experiences of the people that were writing this. The resurrection is an historical fact. There's a few pieces of evidence that tell us that in this passage alone. Number one is Mary. Please understand, ladies, in this culture, you were second-class citizens. This culture did not treat you with the dignity and respect that's worthy of the image bearers that you are, ladies. And so for the, for the fact that Mary is mentioned as being the first one at the tomb would have been an embarrassing reality that the disciples could have easily hit as they wrote this, but they don't. They tell the truth. Secondly, we have multiple details that are markers of eyewitness testimony. You have embarrassing kind of weird events like John was faster than Peter. What's that about? Why do you have to include that? He's telling you this is not just something he dreamed up. It actually happened. And he does want us to know he's faster than Peter. <laughs> probably because he was younger. We don't know that for sure, but probably. There's historical evidence here that this is not just a fable or story. No, they're telling you as eyewitnesses what happened. But the third and most important piece of evidence in this passage is the empty tomb. There is no body even when the early Jewish leaders attack the church, they can't produce the body. They claim that he was stolen away. There's never been a body of Jesus produced because he's alive. As sure as World War I and World War II happened, as sure as you got up this morning and came to this place, Jesus rose from the dead. Amen. Christian, don't forget what you are believing and trusting your life with is an historical event that's real. This passage, though, doesn't just talk about a definitive historical power. It also shows a kind of dominance to Christ's power. A dominant power is what we see in this passage. Look at verses 5 and through 7, and notice how frequently the linen cloths are referenced. If you've got a pen or a highlighter, you can underline these. Look at verse 5. This is John writing from his perspective. It says, stooping down, John saw the linen cloth lying there, but he did not go in. Then following him, Simon Peter also came. He entered the tomb and saw the linen cloths lying there. Verse seven, the wrapping that had been on his head was not lying with the linen cloths, but was folded up in a separate place by itself. Now remember, when you see repetition in your Bible, pay attention. That's three references to the linen cloths in just three verses. Now, this is in part wanting us to see that Christ most likely passed right through the linen cloths. In the same way that he passes through the door and he's in the midst of the disciples, that's probably what's going on here. Christ passed right through those. But there's also a deliberate contrast John is making between Jesus and Lazarus. Now think back to Lazarus. When Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, do you remember how he came out? He came out wrapped in the linen cloth. He looked like a mummy, all right? He was stumbling out of the tomb there. And Jesus says, get those things off of him. He's alive. Jesus doesn't come out with the linen cloths on. He comes out 
leaving the clothes associated with death behind him. Because death no longer has a claim on his life. You see that? These linen cloths over and over again, even the wrapping on the head, something that we know Lazarus was wearing means Jesus has risen never to return to death again. Lazarus would go on to die again. He would die. Jesus will never die again. Again, Jesus doesn't crawl out of the grave. Jesus doesn't just squeak by and just kind of resuscitate himself and come out. No, Jesus dominantly, powerfully rises from the dead. This leads to the third and final thing I want to say about the power of Jesus, and that is that his power defeats death. It's important during the resurrection, uh, resurrection Sunday and this season at large to think about death as an opponent, Think about death as an opponent that's unstoppable. Death, this force that none of us can evade, Jesus takes on in his resurrection. I remember in 2007, the New England Patriots were undefeated until they got to the Super Bowl. How many of you remember this? And there's this catch, right, with the hand and the football and the helmet, the miraculous catch that leads the New York football giants to defeat what appeared to be the unstoppable, invincible, and I would add the word evil, New England Patriots. (laughs) I'll throw that in there. They were stopped. What appeared to be an invincible, unstoppable foe is defeated. Now pay attention. Death appears to be an invincible, unstoppable foe that Jesus Christ defeats. That's the resurrection. The resurrection is not just Jesus coming back to life in an isolated kind of event. No, no, no. It's marking a new era in human history where for those of us that know Jesus, we don't have to be afraid of death. We don't have to worry about death. We don't have to wring our hands about death. Our Savior, who's claimed us, who loves us, has defeated death. And because we're with him, we too enjoy his victory. In the presence of victory, you live differently. Because of the victory of Christ's power, live with peace in the victory of Jesus. We saw the joy we're called to because of this victorious new area. The second thing I want you to write down is live with peace in the victory of Jesus. That same power, church family, the power that raised Jesus from the dead has been directed at your heart and at mine if we know him. He's given us new life, risen us, he's raised us from the dead to enjoy him forever. By his power, he saves us. By his power, he keeps us saved. And by his power, one day, he will call us to himself and we will be with him forever. Our oldest member, Miss Lucille, 101, passed away last night and woke up in glory with Jesus Christ. Now, I think we should give her, yeah. I got word about that this morning. And the confidence we have that Lucille is with Jesus is not in Lucille. She's 101, for goodness sakes. The confidence we have that she's with Christ is because of Christ's power. I'll never forget pastoring in Missouri and going to meet with a pillar of our church named John de Graffenried. He was dying. He was hours away from his death, and I was with him. And he looked at me and said, Spencer, I'm not afraid to die. And he said, and I'll never forget this, imprinted on my soul as a young pastor, he said, I know who I have believed in. And I am persuaded that he is able to guard what was entrusted to me until the day of Christ Jesus. And he kept saying that over and over again as he died. I know who I have believed in. Christian, the reason you can face your death, the reason you can face death of people you love and care for with confidence and peace is because Christ's power has overcome death. Live, Christian, with peace in the power of the risen Jesus. Thirdly and finally, though, this passage teaches us of a victorious promise. A victorious promise. 
Verse 8 hooks us into the overall purpose of John's gospel. Look at it with me there in your Bibles. The other disciple, this is John speaking of himself, who had reached the tomb first, then also went in, saw, underline this, and believed. Now John will later tell us, I've written these things not just to give you information about Jesus, I've written these things so that you may know that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing in his name, that you might believe in him, and by by believing in his name, you may have eternal life. The response to the resurrection today is faith. You'll remember faith is acceptance of the truth and reliance on the truth. We believe in something. We believe in Jesus. We accept that it's historical fact. He rose from the dead. You cannot be a Christian and reject the resurrection. You cannot be a Christian and reject this reality because Jesus Christ is not dead. He's alive. So you've got to believe. That's the response. But, Paul, but the writer, John here, makes it clear that the reason he believes here is not necessarily because he's got everything under his hat yet. He doesn't fully understand this. But he gives us some commentary in verse 9 to make sure we understand it. He says, verse 9, For they did not yet understand the Scripture that he must rise from the dead. The reason we believe is not just because it happened, but because it had to happen. The Scriptures tell us that not only Jesus was promised to rise from the dead, not only was the Messiah promised to defeat evil, but that he had to defeat evil if we were going to know God. Looking for a passage of scripture here, I think Genesis 3.15 is a great place to look. I do think that phrase, the scripture, probably refers to a larger just kind of force of the Old Testament teaching. But Genesis 3.15 paints this picture of the seed of the woman crushing the head of the serpent. And from Genesis 3.15 forward, we're looking for this deliverer to come and defeat evil once and for all. John makes it clear that the reason we believe in the resurrection, the reason we trust that resurrection is because it had to happen for you and I to enjoy eternal life. The reason this is important as we think about Easter today is because this sets a track record that points us forward. Promises fulfilled in the past point us to promises that have yet to be fulfilled in the future. God has a track record of keeping Every single promise he's made to us. Every one of them. And so when we come to the resurrection, we're not just looking back to what God's promised and fulfilled in Jesus. We're also called to look forward. What's coming? What are we looking forward to? We're looking forward to that resurrected Jesus, that high priest who's interceding for us, returning as a conquering king. Please don't forget that Jesus is accomplishing his mission through two unique entrances. In the first entrance of Jesus, he comes to die and to rise from the dead. In the second return, the second entrance of Jesus has returned, he comes to rule and to reign forever. We look forward because of this reality to Christ's return. Verse 10 tells us the disciples return to the place they were staying. We know that this sets up Jesus coming to them. This sets a pattern from verse 10 forward of Jesus through his spirit coming to us, convicting us, drawing us, opening our eyes to the need for Christ. But that drawing, that coming, that pursuing that happens in John's gospel will culminate one day when Christ comes to pursue us once and for all. Because of this promise of the victory of Jesus in the future. Live with hope. Live with hope in the victory of King Jesus. Church, be careful of the corrosive effects of cynicism. It is so easy right now to develop a cynical spirit about how things are going. It is easy to develop a kind of Anger, where just this low-level rage is just kind of constantly with you because of what you're taking in through media or social media. But the reality is what we have in Jesus means that one day all of these things, all of them are going to be made right. 
You can long for Jesus' return and know that you will be fulfilled. Hope is an expectation of fulfillment in the future that will not disappoint. I hope the Cowboys do better this year. That's not the kind of hope we're talking about, though, when we talk about Jesus. We're talking about a settled, fulfilled expectation. When I was growing up in the 90s, I was a big Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle fan. And I remember very vividly, I think I was like in fifth or sixth grade, I was so excited about Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 3. They made like three of these movies, probably one too many. Because I got in there, I was all hyped up, I had my popcorn, I had my Coke, I was there early for the previews, and I watched the movie going, this is terrible. Why did they make this movie? It's, oh, they're trying to make more money and you got to make another one, all the things. We've all experienced that, right? Where you long for something, and in fact, you long for it so much that when you finally get to it, your expectations are so high, it doesn't actually fulfill you. We've all had that experience where we long for something, and then we get to the moment, and it's not what we hoped it would be. Listen to me. You can long for Jesus and his return with everything that you have, knowing you will be fulfilled. You will never be unfulfilled when you hope and long for King Jesus. Jesus Christ is the resurrected, victorious King. Because that's the case, live with joy. Live with joy, with gratitude for what he's done for you. Live with peace, trusting his power and work in your life. Live with hope as you look forward to his return. As I close this morning, I just want to give a word to those of you that may not be Christians. I know most of what I've said today is for followers of Jesus. I want to finish this morning just by talking to some of you today who may not be Christians. You know, the longer I pastor in Texas and in the Bible Belt, the more I realize the hardest job I have in sharing the gospel with people is convincing them they're not Christians. A lot of people walk this earth just assuming they're Christians And so what I want to do kind of differently this morning as I close this morning is I just want to make sure you understand what a Christian is. I want to try to paint the picture for you of what an actual follower of Jesus is. And this is my question as we close this morning. Is this you? I want you to prayerfully consider as I talk about what a Christian is, that you consider, is this who I am in my day-to-day life? A Christian, very simply, is somebody who repents of sin and trusts Jesus Christ. Notice I'm using those words in present tense realities. I'm not talking just about a decision you made one time when you were at camp. I'm not talking just about church attendance or religious activity. I'm not talking about your grandparents' faith or your parents' faith. I'm saying a Christian is somebody who repents of sin, turns from their sin, turns from worship of self, and trusts Jesus that he died for them, rose from the dead, and by faith you receive new life. I think one of the most beautiful places we see this vision of the Christian life displayed is in Jesus' interaction with the Samaritan woman caught in, or the woman caught in adultery. Jesus has this woman brought to him. She's caught in the act of adultery. There's this whole army of people coming around ready to stone her. And what does Jesus say? He who is without sin cast the first stone. And what happens? One by one, all of them leave, and Jesus is there. Don't miss this. Jesus is qualified to stone her because he is without sin. He asks her, hey, where, where are the people that accused you? So they're, they're, they're gone. No one accuses me, Lord. She calls him Lord. And he says two things to her. Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. The Christian life A Christian is someone who has received the forgiveness of Jesus by faith. No condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. No shame, no guilt because of what Christ has done for us. But a Christian is also a person who lives a life of holiness and purity before God. Not to earn God's favor, but because you have God's favor. Not to earn God's approval, but because you have God's approval. This Easter, the question is, are you a person who's not only received 
God's grace and mercy in your life? Is that showing up in how you live? Is that you? That picture of what I've described about what a Christian actually is, is not you. The way you respond is by repenting of your sin and trusting Jesus Christ. There could be no better way to spend Easter Sunday than really wrestling whether this picture of a Christian that the Bible gives us is actually you. I'm gonna pray for you, but before I pray, I just wanna say this. If you have questions about becoming a Christian, if you have questions about what it means to truly be a follower of Jesus, as soon as the service is over, you've heard about our Next Step Corner, that's a place you can go to pray with people, talk with people, have questions answered before you leave today. If you're here today and you're not a follower of Jesus, we wanna invite you today this day to repent of your sin and trust Jesus Christ. And we have people there in the back that would love an opportunity to help you with that. You can do that while we're singing. You can go back there. You can do that after the service is over. But don't leave today, this day, without really wrestling with the question, am I truly a follower of Jesus? Would you pray with me, please? Heavenly Father, I'm thankful that we this morning in song, in prayer, video, the word, we've all had our hearts moved and lifted to see the victory of Jesus. I do pray for the Christians in this room, Lord, that they would live with joy. They would fight the fight of gratitude in their hearts today. I pray that they live with peace and assurance in your power. I pray that they would live with hope because of your coming return. But God, as we close this service, I do wanna lift up people in this room, some of whom may have even been raised in church, some of whom may even still be coming because their parents make them come. But God, who know deep down, they don't know you. They know about you. They're aware of you, but they don't know you. Oh God, by your spirit and the power of the resurrection, would you open the hearts and the eyes of the blind? God, would you show them their dire need for you? And would they turn from their sin and trust you today? I pray, God, that you would crowd out pride, distractions, things from their past even that may keep them from really wrestling with this question. And I pray, Lord Jesus, by your grace, they'd come to know you as Savior and Lord today. God, thank you for your mercy and grace you've shown us in your son, Jesus. As we close now and sing the song, lift our voices to you. Pray that your word would continue to bear fruit in our hearts and our lives. In Jesus' name, I pray all these things. Amen.